Dear Heavenly Father, please be with us and be with our spirit, our mind, our heart, Lord, as we talk about important subjects. Father, please um, forgive me of my sins and put the words in my mouth that you would have me speak. We pray all this in your blessed Son's name. Amen. The Midnight Cry. What we're going to do, we're going to go over the Midnight Cry. Of course, this story is taken from the book of Matthew. It's a parable that Jesus is telling his disciples. And um, the story of the interaction between Jesus and his disciples actually starts in Matthew chapter 24. And what we're going to do, we're just going to kind of go through, uh, and I know that we've all been gone through this before, but I hope today you'll think about it in a different light. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to go to the script, scripture references, and then we're going to break it down, okay? Matthew chapter 25 and verse 1. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins. And by the way, before I read on, if you go back in Matthew chapter 24, Jesus' disciples are asking him, what is going to be the sign of your coming in the end of the world? So Jesus is answering, then, when is then? At the end of the world. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. And five of them were wise and five were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. So when they all start out, we have an image up here. They all have what? They all have oil. They all have some oil and they all have their lamps. And they're all burning, right? But the, verse 4, But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. So as you can see on the image here, not only do they have lamps, but they have what? Extra oil, extra vessels. Verse 5. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. That's something really to think about. Every single one of us, uh, should we be a wise or a foolish virgin, uh, you're all, we're all going to be asleep. We're all going to fall asleep. But look at this in verse 6. And at midnight a cry was made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go you out to meet him. So here they are. They are sound asleep, right? Sound asleep. Now, what happens to the foolish virgins when they are sound asleep? You see it in the picture there? It went out, right? Then, verse 7, then all those virgins, then who? All. all. Do you know what that means? That when the cry goes out, everybody hears it. There's not five that are still asleep and five that wake up. They all hear it, but when, the, when they all arose and they what? They trimmed their lamps. But the ones that didn't have anything to trim, what's going on? Verse 8, And the foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. You see this little image right here where they're having this discussion. Verse 9, But the wise answered, saying, Not so, lest there not be enough for us and for you, but go rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was what? Shut. You can see in the background of this painting. In the background, what do you see? You see the five virgins trying to buy oil, and the door is being shut when this goes on. We've talked about this before in the past. At this dark hour in world's history, the only people that can buy or sell are those that have the mark of the beast. This is going to be an awful time. Verse 11, 
afterward came also the other virgin, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But, the, but he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. So are these Christians? Yes. They're Adventist Christians, right? They're virgins. It's a pure church. And they're Lord, Lord. So they're, you know, they're in the habit of saying, Lord, Lord, I know you not. Mrs. White talks about that, that when this pronouncement is made, it will be the most awful words that will ever be heard. I know you not. You know, in Matthew chapter 7, I just want to take a break here for, from this because this class of people is illustrated in another way in Matthew chapter 7. Because these are the people that say, Lord, Lord, right? Isn't that what the virgins are saying? Lord, Lord. In Matthew chapter 7. In Matthew chapter 7. In verse 21. You know what? And let's start in verse 20. Wherefore, by their free fruits, you, ye shall know them. Fruits are important, right? Verse 21, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. So you can see that you have this group that says, Lord, Lord, and they're not entering in. Amen? Only those that do the will of his Father. And let's continue reading. Many will say in that day, Lord, Lord. Have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name have done many wonderful works. And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a what? Wise man. Talking about the wise virgins here, which built their house upon what? A rock. And the rain descended. What rain is that? It's the light of rain. And the floods came. And what's that flood? Hold your finger here. Turn with me to Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12. And verse 15, and the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a what? Flood after the woman that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood. And the earth helped the woman and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood, which the dragon cast out of his mouth. And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. So these people here that build their house on a foundation are keeping the commandments of God and having the testimony of Jesus. Verse 25, And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew. What winds are those? Man, those are the four winds too, aren't they? And beat upon that house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. And every one that heareth these things of mine and doeth them not shall be likened unto a foolish man that built his house upon the sand. And the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat upon that house and it fell and great was the fall of it. So what kind of a foundation do we have to build on? A rock. And Jesus Christ has given us a what? Sure foundation and I'm talking about the foundations of Adventism, friends. That's what we're talking about today. <clears throat> I know you not. Listen to this quote right here from Review and Herald. Hmm. I didn't get the date, the month there. I, wanna th I think it's April. Let me look that up really quickly. I think I have it. Or I'll, we'll get it in a few minutes. Um, Review and Herald, 1890. 
When the third angel's message is preached as it should be, power attends its proclamation. Do we see real power right now in the third angel's message? Which means what? That means it's not being preached as it should be, right? When the third angel's message is preached as it should be, power attends its proclamation, and it becomes an abiding influence. It must be attended with divine power, or it will accomplish nothing. I am often referred to the parable of the ten virgins. So here we have now Mrs. White talking about a direct link between the parable of the ten virgins and what? The, The three angels' message. I am often referred to the parable of the ten virgins, five of whom were wise and five foolish. This parable has been and will be fulfilled to the very letter. For it has a special application to this time, and like the third angel's message, has been fulfilled and will continue to be present truth to the close of time. I've said this before. Um, like the third angel's message has been fulfilled and will continue to be present truth. Friends, did you ever think about that this understanding of the midnight cry is present truth? It's present truth. Can you give the present truth if you don't understand this message? It's the present truth, friends. And it will be the present truth to the close of time. Now notice this, this parable has been, in other words, she's saying it has been, and it will be fulfilled to the very letter. Now, in order to understand that, we need to break it down. So what I'm going to do here is we're going to go over on the screen a series of little images, and we're going to go point by point as to how this all transpires. Now the first image that we see on the screen is they hear of the wedding. So the virgins, they hear there's going to be a wedding. And what do they do? Well, they get their lamps and they get into their wedding outfits and all this. And uh, it's kind of like, how many of us, I I can speak for myself here on this, how many of us were ever going to be picked up by somebody or go on a trip or whatever and they say well get ready and I'll come by and get you and you get ready and you're all dressed you got your luggage or whatever and you had assumed they would be there by a certain time and they don't show up right and you know after a while what do you do well you keep looking out the window But eventually, you say, well, maybe I'll go over here and do this, or I'll do a couple things, and then you go out and look out the window. And eventually, maybe you sit down in a chair by the window, and you're waiting and waiting, and then what happens? You fall asleep. So in the next image right here, they fall asleep. And why do they fall asleep? Because they entered into a tarrying time. The bridegroom tarried. They thought he was going to come at a certain time, but he didn't come at a certain time. And they entered into a tarrying time, and they all fall asleep. Right? Do we see this? Point by point. The next thing happens. The foolish, when they're falling asleep, what happens to their lamps? (coughs) Their lamps go out. Do they even realize their lamps go out? Then what happens? A cry at midnight, and it wakes all, both the wise and the sleeping. They're going to be woken up. And you know, how many of you guys, let me see a show of hands, in the middle of midnight deep sleep, how many people just love to be woken up? with a cry, you know, some kind of a thing that just wakes you up. What kind of condition are you in (coughs) when you're woken up like that? Huh? I mean, you know, 
Yeah, I mean, it, it takes a little adjusting, doesn't it? So then what happens after that? A separation takes place. And what happens here? What's going on here? There's a, there's a line of demarcation, isn't there? There's those that are burning bright lamps and those that are in darkness. Right? The separation takes place and the foolish go to what? Buy. The foolish go to buy. And then what happens? The wise enter into the wedding supper. The door is shut while foolish go to buy. That's basically it in a nutshell. These points right here. Now, let's talk about this. Do you know that when Jesus told the story of this parable, that this really happened? It really happened. It was a real wedding that really took place. But it was also a parable for in the future. And Ellen White says this parable has been and will be repeated to the very letter. So now let's look at this. We, we have our ancient marriage event that takes place in the time of Christ, right? Now let's look at how it was fulfilled in the Millerite period. Here is a picture of three men. Who are these three men? William Miller, Josiah Litch, and Joshua V. Himes, Joshua Von Himes. Okay? The reason I put these three men on here is because these three men were the ones that were the most responsible for getting the initial message out that Jesus was coming. So, William Miller was giving the understanding of the day for a year principle. Okay? Joshua, I mean, uh, uh, Josiah Litch took those principles of, in, of prophetic interpretation and he was able to unlock the mysteries of the Bible in regard to time, to the event that was going to happen just before the coming of Christ. And Joshua V. Himes, well, he took everything they said and promoted it. Right? You can't have, you can't have the judgment hour cry without these three men. They all work together with this. Okay? Now notice this. What was it, what was it that gave impetus to their message? Well, first of all, in the mouth of two or three witnesses, they had come together as three men that were working together to get out a message. And here's the message they got out. At the very time specified, Turkey, through her ambassadors, accepted the protection of the allied powers of Europe and thus placed herself under the control of Christian nations. The event exactly fulfilled the prediction when it became known Multitudes were convinced of the correctness and principles of prophetic interpretation adopted by Miller and his associates. And a wonderful impetus was given to the Advent movement. Men of learning and position united with Miller, both in preaching and publishing his views. And from 1840 to 44, the work rapidly extended. What were Miller's views? Jesus was coming. Amen. So what happens? The virgins gather together. They put on their wedding garments. They got their lamps because Jesus is coming, right? And then what happens? Jesus doesn't come when they first expected. Miller said, if I'm correct, I believe that Jesus will come and take us home sometime between March 21 1843 and March 21, 1844, right? March 21, 1844 comes and goes, and then they set another date for April, and that date comes and goes, and now what happens? Their bags are packed, they're ready to go, the master doesn't come, they enter into the tearing time, and they all sleep. So they're having these meetings, 
Why didn't Jesus come? Why didn't Jesus come? And they just start to kind of uh, lose their way a little bit here. Fall asleep. Listen to this quote from uh, Great Controversy, page 390. When the time passed at which the Lord's coming was first expected in the spring of 1844, those who had looked in faith for his appearing were for a season involved in doubt and uncertainty. Now, was that just the foolish? No. No. It says, those who looked in faith for his appearing and all those that have accepted the message of Miller and his associates were all looking for Jesus appearing. And when he didn't come at the time that they thought, they all were involved in a, da- in a season of doubt and uncertainty. Friends, they were in the tarrying time. Then what happens next? The foolish, their lamps go out. Many, unfortunately, from this period on, they lose their enthusiasm. They lose their enthusiasm for continuing their studies to find out why Jesus hadn't come. Look at this quote right here from GC, page 390. Many continue to search the scriptures, examining anew the evidence of their as evidences of their faith and carefully studying the prophecies to obtain further light. The Bible testimony in support of their position seemed clear and conclusive. Signs which could not be mistaken pointed to the coming of Christ as near. Many of the faithful, they said, no, we can't reject these signs that have already happened. And they continued their studies. And the foolish virgins were with them too, but you know what they didn't do? They were going off the light of their fellow virgins. And then what happens? A cry at midnight. A cry at midnight comes, and it wakes up who? All. This here is from uh, uh, John Loughborough. Notice what he says here. Adventists assembled at the same Exeter, New Hampshire. It was reported that there were 3,000 in the encampment. It was held in the woods, in the open. No cloth pavilion for camp services. Sound familiar? We're always in the outside, aren't we? (laughs) But plenty of seats. (laughs) Plenty of seats. I noticed that in Mrs. White's writing, she talks a lot about seats. And especially when she talked about uh, the, uh, when uh, the Eastern question was going out, she goes, they had thousands of seats, and even with backs, they had backs in the seats. Plenty of seats. On Sunday forenoon, Elder Joseph Bates was preaching when a man came riding at full speed into the camp. That's why I had him on horseback there. Placed his horse where they kept their stock, and then came in to the audience and seated himself by the family of Elder John Couch. With open Bible, in a whisper, he explained to them that the cause of their disappointment and the midnight cry that was now due. I think that's interesting. He explained in a whisper about the midnight cry. Brother Bates was using an illustration of their course in patient waiting, his experience on nearing home on a sea voyage. After a long absence, the power of God came upon Sister Couch. She arose and beckoned to Brother Bates. He said, Sister, what is it? She replied, What you are saying is all very good, but here is a man who has light on the midnight cry. Well, said Brother Bates, then let him come up here on the platform. And give it to the people. And he sat down. The minister who thus walked into the stand was S.S. Snow, who in a few sentences gave them the path of his midnight cry message. And here is what he said. Brother Snow thus questioned them. Where are we in our Advent experience? Answer from the audience. In the tarrying time. 
Question. How long was the vision to tarry? Answer. Until midnight. Question. What is a day in prophecy? Answer. A year. Question. Then what would be what would a night be? Answer. Six months. Question. What would midnight be? Answer. Three months. Question. How long have you been in the tarrying time? Answer. Just three months. He said, Then it is just midnight now, and I am here with the midnight cry. In a few sentences, he explained that it was the fall of 457 that the decree went forth. And so they were short six months in their reckoning, showing them that the 2300 days would terminate on October 22, 1844, instead of the spring as they had previously supposed. Then in a strong voice he said, Behold, the bridegroom cometh on the tenth day of the seventh month, October 22, 1844. Go ye out to meet him. And as he uttered those words, the mighty power of God swept over the camp, prostrating many to the ground and suddenly turning the camp into a most powerful confessing and testimony meeting. That was only the beginning of the midnight cry message. Of that movement, Brother Southerd said, In the midnight cry, the paper of which he was editor, it swept over the land with the velocity of a tornado, and it reached hearts in different and distant places almost simultaneously, and in a manner which can be accounted for only on the supposition that God was in it. What takes place next? We're just basically lining all these points up with the other points from the story of Matthew chapter 25. This cry goes out, the virgins wake up, and after they wake up and trim their lamps, what takes place? A separation takes place. A separation takes place. And here you have right here, this is S.S. Snow, picture him. And this right here is his true midnight cry study, his five-point study. And what does this lead to? In that memorable year when the cry, Behold the bridegroom cometh, was moving with railroad speed. The mighty messenger with a voice of thunder. What a raging among the wicked. So as this messenger is going out proclaiming the soon coming of Christ, what happens? The wicked in the world were raging. Did you know that they were coming in and busting up Advent meetings and there was violence and threats and all these kind of things? Remember, The parable of the ten virgins has been and will be repeated to the very letter. What a raging among the wicked and breaking up of Advent meetings, but more striking, more striking than all that, but more striking still was the development of character among the virgins. Did you know that uh, Ellen White says that... um, You can't develop your character in a a crisis. What What is revealed in a crisis is your character. Amen? It's not the development time. It's the time that's going to show you what kind of character you have. And so as this crisis is happening and the wicked are coming down on God's people, the wicked are coming down on the on the virgins, the most striking Development was the character among the virgins. Because what had been developed? Two characters. Two characters. Ellen White talks in another place where she says that what what is revealed in a crisis is your character and that guess what's going to happen? There's going to be a separation. The midnight cry is going to be refulfilled and she doesn't say what it is but she says it's an event that's going to bring the the soul face to face with death let's read on but more striking still was the development of character among the virgins during the 10 days 
to the 22nd of October, the sounding of the seventh message caused simultaneous dispersion among the virgins. Disgust, dismay, disappointment, grief, contempt, scorn, and evil surmisings on one hand. Friends, let me repeat this again. This is going on among Adventists. Let's repeat it. Simultaneous dispersion among the virgins. Friends, I can tell you right now, this is going to be repeated to the very letter. What are these attributes? Disgust, dismay, disappointment, grief, contempt, scorn, and evil surmisings on one hand. While others, so that's one group that's doing this. While on the other hand, while others are boldly declaring that the message was just what we believed, although we were surprised at the effect it was producing. Do you get that? When the, when the people are boldly declaring the message, that's what's causing all this other stuff to go on. Here was the point and particular time. Don't forget it, Elder Bates says here. Don't forget it. And Ellen White says we have nothing to fear for the future, lest we forget how the Lord has led us in His teachings in our past history. And friends, this is something that we can't forget. And here's the trouble with the thing. Most Seventh-day Adventists don't even know this story. They can't even forget it because they never heard it. Here was the point and particular time, don't forget it, where the division of the virgins took place. They began to go away for oil or to look for it from a different source. Friends, it was a separation. And it wasn't some separation that couldn't be seen. It was, it, 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 friends, listen, to Elder Bates is saying that this event was even more shocking and more illustrated than the effect, than the fact that people were coming into our meetings. And, do, and I don't know if you guys know the history. I mean, they were coming in with clubs and all this kind of stuff and completely disrupting the meetings. When's the last time we had that? Horseshoe was thrown at who? Uh, Miller? Uh, Miller. Hi. James, James White? Missed him in the head. So, look, I mean, can you imagine that? We've never had meetings like this. But, but Elder Bates is saying here, as, as startling as that was, this was more startling. The separation that takes place. And then what's the next thing? The wise enter in. The foolish virgins, they separate. They go another way. They go to buy oil. But the wise enter in. And what is it they enter into? Look at this quote right here from Early Writings, page 260. Those who rejected the first message could not be benefited by the second, neither were they benefited by the midnight cry, which was to prepare them to enter with Jesus by faith into the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. What did they enter in into in 1844? The sanctuary message. But those foolish virgins, they couldn't enter in. They couldn't enter in. And you know why they couldn't enter in? Because they didn't have the oil to be able to understand how to enter by faith into the most holy place. Friends, look at this. We see here... Now, earlier, a few minutes ago, we did a line-by-line, -line, point by point image with caption of what happened in Jesus' parable. And now we've done a point by point, line by line, with captions of what happened during the midnight cry. Okay? And the reason, and the reason why, why this paper here that causes the separation is called the true midnight cry is because there was another midnight cry coming back here. In fact, that was the name of their publication. It was called the midnight cry. 
And the midnight cry was saying what? That Jesus would come sometime between March 21 and March 22, 1843 to 44. Did it happen? It did not happen. And this is why Elder Snow is saying this is the true midnight cry. This is the true midnight cry. But friends, listen. There's going to be another true midnight cry. Because of this. And I repeat, when the third angel's message is preached as it should be, power attends its proclamation, and it becomes an abiding influence. You know what abiding means? It stays with you. You might go to sleep. You might get sleepy. You might fall asleep, but it's going to abide with you. It must be attended with divine power, or it will accomplish nothing. I am often referred to the parable of the ten virgins, five of whom were wise and five foolish. This parable has been and will be fulfilled to the very letter, for it has a special application for this time. And like the third angel's message has been fulfilled and will continue to be present truth to the close of time. Friends, listen, make no mistake about it. That parable of that wedding the event that was fulfilled during the Millerite period in 1844 are all typifying now. And I'm not going to get into where I think we are in it and everything, but friends, it's going to be repeated to the very letter exactly how it was fulfilled in the past. It's going to be repeated. And there's going to be a separation that's going to take place. There's going to be a cry at midnight. There's going to be a point where the soul is brought face to face with death. And if we don't do what we can right now in this tearing time to get oil in our vessels so that we can trim our lamps when the cry goes out, we'll be on the wrong side of the separation. And we won't be able to enter into the most holy place and have our sins removed before what happens probation closes and the door will forever be shut and friends let me just give you a clue on something here what was the message that miller and his associates were proclaiming that gave impetus to the first angel's message and the judgment hour cry the fall of the ottoman empire amen friends listen listen to this the message of Islam in the Bible gave power to our message. And friends, listen, it's going to do the same thing again. It's going to do the same thing again. But at the end, what's going to take separation here? What's going to take separation is that we're not going to be in agreement. We're not going to be in agreement in this verse. T turn with me to the book of Daniel. Daniel chapter 11 and verse 45. And the Bible says this, And he shall plant the tabernacles of his palace between the seas and the glorious holy mountain. Yet he shall come to his end, and none shall help him. And at that time Michael shall stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people, and there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even to that same time. And at that time many people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book, and many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to ever, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. And they that be what? wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever friends will the wise understand daniel 11 verse 45 yes. amen friends and they will proclaim that message and that message that empowered this message in 1844 will empower our message again at the end it will be repeated to the very letter amen, amen. let's pray Dear Heavenly Father, you have not left us in darkness. You have given us the sure word of prophecy, a bright light, 
that shines to the dawning of the day, to the day star rise in our hearts. Dear Lord, we thank you so much that you do nothing unless you reveal it to your servants, the prophets. You have given us a clear order of events because our message is no longer based on time, but based on events. These events are happening in their order. Lord, wake us up. Help us to put the oil in our lamps. Help us to turn away from sin and sinning. We are all in the same condition. None, none is better than another. We're asleep, Lord. We're in our Laodicean condition. Poor, blind, miserable, wretched, and naked. Help us, Lord, to get the eye salve. Help us, Lord, to put on the white wedding garment. And dear Heavenly Father, Please give us the gold tried in the fire. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.